नमस्कार अ वॉम वेलकम टू वर्ल्ड न्यूज एंड इंडियन परस्पेक्टिव ऑन आकाशवाणी दिस इज सायरम मुजतबा ब्रिंगिंग ग्लिम्सेस ऑफ द मेजर डेवलपमेंट्स ऑफ द डे फ्रॉम अक्रॉस द ग्लोब ओवर द नेक्स्ट हाफ एन आवर वी शेल ब्रिंग यू द लेटेस्ट फ्रॉम द वर्ल्ड ऑफ पॉलिटिक्स इकोनॉमी स्पोर्ट्स एंटरटेनमेंट एंड मोर द हेडलाइंस India and Cambodia discuss ways to enhance development cooperation and people to people ties. Defence Minister Rajnath Singh says growing structure of India on the world stage owing to its fast expanding economy and progressive government efforts. Prime Minister of Nepal Pushkamal Dahal Prachand to reach New Delhi on Wednesday on a four day visit to India. US ambassador to India says US court approves extradition of 2611 Mumbai attacker Dhawar Rana Prime Minister Modi to chair 22nd summit of SCO Council of Heads of State on 4th of July Drone strike hits residential area in Moscow Russia accuses Ukraine for the attacks United States and Saudi Arabia welcome extension of a ceasefire deal between Sudan's warring military factions for another 5 days And Venezuela's president Nicolas Maduro visits Brazil for the first time since he was banned by former far-right president Jair Bolsonaro in 2019. And now the news in detail. President Draupadi Murmu held productive talks with King of Cambodia Norodom Sihamoni at Rashtrapati Bhavan on Tuesday evening. The agenda covered furthering the cultural and civilizational connect between India and Cambodia they also discussed ways to enhance development cooperation and people to people ties president murmu hosted a state banquet in honor of the visiting dignitary providing a fillip to india cambodia ties prime minister modi also held a warm meeting with king of cambodia norodom sihamoni in new delhi they reviewed bilateral relations and discussed ways to advance india cambodia partnership in domains of capacity building human human resource development tourism culture and defense they also exchanged views on regional and multilateral issues king of cambodia norodom sihamoni also met vice president jagdeep dhankar they had wide ranging discussions on bilateral relations and other issues of mutual interest earlier mr sihamoni was accorded the guard of honor at rashtrapati bhavan the king of cambodia arrived in new delhi on monday on a three day visit to india Defence Minister of India Rajnath Singh interacted with the Indian diaspora in Abuja, Nigeria on Monday. During the interaction, Mr Singh spoke about the growing stature of India on the world stage owing to its fast expanding economy and progressive government efforts. He appreciated the positive contribution made by the Indian community in Nigeria and expressed confidence that they will continue to keep the Indian flag flying high. Defence Minister emphasized on the government's focus on atmanirbharta and the significant progress made in defence exports in the recent years towards achieving the objective of make in India make for the world. He also lauded the capabilities of the armed forces in effectively countering any threat or challenge from adversaries. Later Mr Singh interacted with senior Nigerian dignitaries including Chief Justice and Acting Minister of Defence at the dinner hosted by the Indian High Commissioner. Prime Minister of Nepal Pushkamal Dahal Prachand will reach New Delhi on Wednesday afternoon on a four-day official visit to India. This will be the first bilateral visit abroad after assuming office in December last year. He will be accompanied by a high-level delegation. During the visit, the Prime Minister the Nepalese Prime Minister will call on President and Vice President and will hold extensive talks with Prime Minister Modi to discuss the diverse areas of bilateral partnership between India and Nepal. In addition to the official engagements Mr Prashant will be visiting Ujjain and Indore as part of his visit Ministry of External Affairs said the visit continues the tradition of regular high level exchanges between India and Nepal in furtherance of India's neighborhood first policy It said the bilateral relations between the two countries have significantly strengthened in the last few years in all areas of cooperation This visit underscores the importance given by both sides in adding further momentum to the bilateral partnership US ambassador to India Eric Garcetti has said that the US court has approved extradition of 26 Mumbai 2611 Mumbai attacker Dhawar Rana 
and it is a sort of collaboration and cooperation where both US and India are working together to bring terrorists to justice. He said US and India stand together and a recent demonstration of this was one of the funders of that attack can be extradited from the US to India. We know that we stand together and recent uh, demonstration of this was one of the funders of that attack that happened in Mumbai is now by an American court said that he can be extradited to the United States. There's a couple more steps of appeals, but it's that sort of collaboration and cooperation where our people are working together to bring terrorists to justice and we won't stop. Rana was arrested in the US on an extradition request by India for his role in the Mumbai attacks in which 10 Pakistani terrorists laid a more than 60 hour siege attacking and killing over 160 people including six Americans at the iconic and vital locations in Mumbai. A US court in California on the 16th of this month had ruled that imprisoned Pakistan origin Canadian businessman Tahawar Rana who is sought for his involvement in the 2008 Mumbai terror attack can be extradited to India. The seventh round of foreign office consultations between India and Austria were held in New Delhi on Tuesday. It was co-chaired by Secretary West in Ministry of External Affairs Sanjay Verma and Political Director in Federal Ministry for European and International Affairs of Austria Gregor Kreschler. The Ministry of External Affairs said the foreign office consultations provide an provided an opportunity for reviewing bilateral engagements and exchanging views on regional and global issues of mutual interest these include developments in the respective neighborhoods european union ukraine conflict india's presidency of g20 cooperation in multilateral fora and unsc reforms prime minister narendra modi will chair the 22nd summit of the sco council of heads of state on the 4th of july It will be held in the virtual format. India assumed the rotating chairmanship of SCO at the Samarkand summit on the 16th of September last year. All SCO member states, that is China, Russia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Pakistan, Tajikistan and Uzbekistan have been invited to attend the summit. In addition, Iran, Belarus and Mongolia have been invited as observer states. As per the SCO tradition, Turkmenistan has also been invited as the guest of the chair. Heads of two SCO bodies, that is the Secretariat and the SCO Regional Anti-Terrorist Structure or RATS, will also be present. Further, heads of six international and regional organizations have also been invited. The organizations are United Nations, Association of Southeast Asian Nations or ASEAN, Commonwealth of Independent States, CIS, Collective Security Treaty Organization, CSTO, Eurasian Economic Union, EAEU, and Conference on Interaction and Confidence Building Measures in Asia or SICA. The Ministry of External Affairs said the theme of the summit is Towards a Secure SEO. The secure acronym was coined by Prime Minister Narendra Modi at the 2018 SEO summit and stands for Security, Economy and Trade and Connectivity, Unity, Respect for Sovereignty and Territorial Integrity and Environment. These themes have been highlighted during India's chairmanship of SEO. And now in today's hotspot section we bring you an interview with Brendan Wallaki, Minister Counselor for Consular Affairs at the US Embassy in New Delhi on student visas to US. Welcome Consul General Brendan Wallaki, it's great to have you here. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. What is the process for applying for a student visa to the US and what are the necessary documents required for this? After a student receives admission to a university in the United States, that university is going to issue a form I-20. If the student is applying for a J-1 exchange visitor visa, the student, the institution will issue a DS-2019. So once the I-20 or the DS-2019 has been issued, the student will go online. They will pay the visa application fee and the SEVIS fee. They then will complete the DS-160 visa application form online and schedule an appointment. On the day of the interview, the student will needs to prepare they need to bring certain documents to the interview. So what they are going to bring to the interview is the form I-20 or DS-2019. Mm-hmm. They're going to bring copies of the fee receipts. 
they are going to bring the confirmation page from the completed DS-160 visa application. They are going to bring a valid photo. And last, but certainly not least, they are going to bring their passport. And so those are the basic steps of the process to apply. There is a lot of wait time for visas. Is it true for all categories? First, I'm very pleased to say no. Uh, we've been able to eliminate the wait times in all of our priority visa categories. We have uh, one remaining category, and that's for first-time B1, B2 visa applicants. That has a higher wait time. We have made great progress in addressing that wait time since the start of the year. We've reduced the wait time for the B1, B2 category by more than 50%, and we are prepared to devote the resources necessary to continue to bring that wait time down. As for students, Students are one of our highest priority visa appointment categories. And so to address that intense demand for student visas, we are significantly increasing the number of student visa appointments that are available in 2023 over last year, even over last year's record-breaking right. season. So why do student visas get rejected and uh, how can one avoid this? Under U.S. law, the burden is on the applicant to demonstrate during the interview that they're eligible and entitled for a visa. So it's very important that the student use the time during the interview to be able to very clearly articulate why they chose the university that they chose, and that reason is different for every student, and they need to be able to clearly articulate how they intend to pay for their studies. So what the student should avoid is, again, reciting a set facts that they may be memorized from the website or trying to deliver some prepared script. That's not what the officer will want to see. The officer wants to have a candid conversation in which the applicant speaks freely about why they chose the school and how they're going to pay for it. So does the student visa allow students to take up jobs while in the U.S.? Can you tell us in details about optional practical training OPT? Yes. My best advice for students that are interested in student employment while they're in the U.S. studying is to really coordinate closely with designated school officials and school administrators at their university. There are opportunities for students to work and to gain practical knowledge for their studies, but there are certain regulations and restrictions. So it's very important that they are coordinating closely with school authorities to make sure that the employment that they're taking up is in line with the, with the regulations and the requirements. Um, otherwise, if they don't have specific permission to work, they will be working unlawfully and that can jeopardize their student status and their future prospects for employment in the United States, if they so choose that. So where can students find credible information about studying in the United States? Probably the best resource for students is the U.S. India Educational Foundation. USIF has eight centers across India with advisors that are available and the resources to link up prospective students interested in studying in the United States with an appropriate educational institution. They also, USIF provides online educational counseling services. And finally, I would encourage all prospective students to download the mobile app, the Education USA mobile app, which has all sorts of useful information for students interested in going to the United States. Right, sir. What are the measures in place at the embassy and the consulates to address the growing number of students applying for visa? Let me walk back a little bit. Coming out of the pandemic, our staffing was severely reduced. So gradually over time, we have increased the size of our staff. We've been able to bring on um, new staff to enhance our capacity to address visa demand across the board in all categories. Students continue to be a priority for us. So we are committed to devoting all of the resources necessary to ensure that a student interested in studying in the United States will have the opportunity to interview for that visa. We've also expanded the criteria 
in expanding the categories of students that may be eligible to have an interview waiver. And so we're constantly looking at ways in which we can increase access to student visa appointments. And we're excited that student demand is what it is here in India. And we're doing everything we can to make sure that we have interviews available for all students interested in studying in the United States. Would you advise students to go through agents or education consultants for visa slots? No, I do not recommend that. What I will say is that students have the same access to obtain appointments as an agent does. So in a few weeks, we will be releasing another very large tranche of student appointments for the July-August time period. And I am fully confident that once those appointments are released, that all students interested in applying for a visa to the U.S., will be able to obtain an appointment. So no, it's not necessary to use an agent to get a student visa appointment. A record number of student visas were issued last year. Do you expect to open additional slots this summer? That's right. In 2022, we issued more than 125,000 student visas, which was the highest in our history and also the highest of any country in the world. So for 2023, to meet the increased demand for student visas, we are going to make significantly more appointments available than we did last year, which was a record-breaking year. Is there anything a student must avoid doing or saying at the visa interview? Yes, this is very important. Students need to avoid exaggerating their qualifications or making false statements. Every visa applicant, including students, are responsible for all of the information that they present on their application, and they're responsible for all of the information that they present during the course of their interview. So the bottom line on this is students be honest and be candid right. and speak freely about your intentions. Thank you very much, Consul General. Thank you very much for this opportunity. It was great to be here with you today. Thank you. This is Akashwani giving you the world news. Welcome back. Russia has accused Ukraine of launching an early morning drone attack on Moscow, the first time the city has been targeted by multiple drones since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The Russian Defense Ministry said Kiev had staged an attack using at least eight drones and causing minor damage to several buildings. Moscow Mayor Sergei Sovyanin said no one was seriously injured. Russia's defense ministry said all eight drones had been intercepted. Ukraine has denied carrying out the drone strikes. Earlier, Russian media reports had said as many as 30 drones were involved. Authorities have also said several of them fell on buildings after being downed. The U.S. and Saudi Arabia have welcomed the extension of a ceasefire deal between Sudan's warring military factions for another five days. Washington and Riyadh announced the latest deal as well as brokering the previous week-long truce. In a joint statement, they acknowledged that the ceasefire had not been fully observed but said it had allowed the delivery of aid to 2 million people in Sudan. The UN World Food Programme said the relative lull in fighting had allowed it to send supplies to residents trapped in the capital Khartoum for the first time since fighting erupted six weeks ago. The Sudanese army and its rivals from the Rapid Support Forces have accused each other of repeated violations, particularly in the Darfur region. Venezuela's President Nicolas Maduro has visited Brazil for the first time since he was banned by former far-right President Jair Bolsonaro in 2019. Mr. Maduro was received by the new president, fellow leftist Luis Inácio Lula da Silva, ahead of a summit of Latin American leaders in Brasilia. Lula said the importance of Maduro coming here is that it's the beginning of Maduro's return. Mr. Maduro talked of a new era in bilateral relations. Lula said the region should tackle poverty. Mr. Maduro said Venezuela was open for Brazilian investors, stressing that the two countries must be united from now on and always. President Maduro last visited Brazil in 2015. Jair Bolsonaro was ideologically opposed to the leftist Venezuelan leader and unlikely to extend an invitation. In Sri Lanka, an amendment agreement to extend the tenure of a 
one billion US dollar credit facility was signed on Tuesday. The agreement marks an important step in continuing the financial support provided by the Indian side to the Sri Lankan government for the procurement of essential items. The signing ceremony took place in the presence of Sri Lanka's State Minister of Finance, Shehan Sema Singhe, along with senior officials from the Ministry of Finance of Sri Lanka and representatives from the High Commission of India in Colombo. The officials from the State Bank of India joined the event virtually. A report. With the signing of the amendment agreement, the tenure of the $1 billion credit line that was made available to Sri Lanka last year has been extended until March of 2024. The credit line was made available last year when Sri Lanka was in the midst of its worst ever economic crisis. The facility has been instrumental in the urgent procurement of critical supplies for the island nation such as fuel, medicines, food items and industrial raw materials. This extension of financial support further underscores the strong commitment of the government of India as it continues to assist Sri Lanka with a comprehensive package of approximately 4 billion US dollars in line with India's neighborhood first policy for akashwani news ahmed moin farooqi from colombo former pakistan prime minister imran khan was summoned by authorities on tuesday in connection with the violent attack on the historic core commander house in central punjab province a joint investigation team will inquire into the 9th of may violence at the historical building and military mansion which was set on fire after Imran Khan's arrest on corruption charges China's government has called on protesters to turn themselves in after a crowd clash with the police over plans to demolish a mosque in the country's southwest President Xi Jinping's government has tightened control over religion and society Protesters threw water bottles at officers with helmets and shields outside the blue domed Najiang Mosque in Yuxi a city in Yunnan province according to the videos on social media one punched a police officer's helmet but little other violence was shown police called on criminal suspects to turn themselves themselves in following saturday's incident and said there's those who do might receive lighter punishment a police statement vowed zero tolerance toward criminal activities that impede social management A court in 2020 ordered the Najiaying Mosque demolished after ruling it was built without official permission according to a document on the court website. The protesters were Hui whose ancestors were members of China's majority Han ethnic group and adopted Islam according to the videos. The G20 Digital Innovation Alliance G20 DIA recently hosted an international road show at the Taj Business Bay in Dubai. bringing together industry leaders, policy makers and innovators to discuss the significant impact of digital public goods on humanity's upliftment. Co-hosted by Fiki, the Consulate General of India and the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology METI, the event shed light on various aspects of digital innovation and entrepreneurship. The panel discussion titled Digital Public Goods: Impact on Humanity Upliftment delved into the transformative power of digital innovation in addressing societal challenges. Faisal Tukan, CEO of Zena, emphasized the revolutionary impact of the Unified Payments Interface or UPI, while Nandi Vardhan Mehta, CFO of CAF Investments, highlighted the challenges faced within the digital ecosystem. Mehta also drew a distinction between digital public goods, which should be shared with other countries and for the greater good of humanity. and digital goods primarily managed by the private sector during the discussion it was revealed that approximately 400 million people worldwide still lack access to the internet underscoring the urgency of bridging the digital divide wildfires in the atlantic canadian province of nova scotia have destroyed homes and caused thousands of people to evacuate on monday Around 16,400 people have been fo- were forced to leave their homes near Halifax, Nova Scotia's largest city. The region has seen over 100 more wildfires than last year, fueled by drier than normal conditions. Evacuation orders have also been issued in British Columbia as fires continue to blaze in the country's west. In a tweet on Monday, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau called the fires in Nova Scotia incredibly serious. and said his government is on standby to offer assistance if needed a total of seven wildfires were burning in nova scotia on tuesday morning one of which is estimated to cover 788 hectares northwest of halifax 
according to the Nova Scotia Department of Natural Resources. The blaze led officials to declare a local state of emergency in Halifax late on Sunday. No injuries have been reported, but at least 200 homes and structures are believed to have been damaged by the fire, officials in Halifax said on Monday night. Key domestic indices on Tuesday closed with marginal gains of 0.2%. The Sensex at the Bombay Stock Exchange finished near the 63,000 mark, while the Nifty at the National Stock Exchange settled above 18,600 level. Both indices rose amid mixed cues from global share markets. A report. The Sensex climbed 123 points to finish at 62,969. The Nifty appreciated 35 points to end at 18,634. Asian stocks gained except Singapore's Straits Time Index, which fell 0.2%. South Korea's Kospi rose 1%, while Japan's Nikkei 225, China Shanghai Composite Index and Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index added marginally up to 0.2%. European markets were mixed in intraday trade. Oil prices fell around 1.5% in intraday trade. Crude prices fell amid concerns about the U.S. debt ceiling packed and mixed messages before OPEC plus meeting on June 4th. In intraday trade, Brent crude was trading at $75.75 a barrel. Back home, gold prices at multi-commodity exchange for June contracts were trading at around 59,780 rupees per 10 gram. On the other hand, silver was trading at 71,170 rupees per kilogram for July contracts when reports last came in. And in the forex market, the rupee closed at 82 rupees and 72 pesa against the US dollar. Anubha Rohatki for World News, Akashmani. And now let's take a look at the major developments around the world as reported in the foreign press. The Wall Street Journal reports, China's fading recovery reveals deeper economic struggles. The Guardian writes, U.S. made restrict visas for Ugandan officials in wake of anti-LGBTQ plus laws. Le Monde reports, North Korea says it will launch its first military spy satellite. The Japan Times reports, Taiwan rushes to prevent China from cutting off internet and phones. Washington Post reports Erdogan becomes an era-defining electoral autocrat. South China Morning Post writes, U.S. President Joe Biden and Kevin McCarthy push for votes on spending deal as U.S. debt default looms. And now a quick look at the headlines once again. India and Cambodia discuss ways to enhance development cooperation and people-to-people ties. Defence Minister Rajnath Singh says growing structure of India on the world stage owing to its fast-expanding economy and progressive government efforts. U.S. Ambassador to India says U.S. court approves extradition of 2611 Mumbai attacker Tahavar Rana. Prime Minister Narendra Modi to chair 22nd summit of SCO Council of Heads of State on 4th July. Drone strike hits residential area in Moscow. Russia accuses Ukraine for the attacks. U.S. and Saudi Arabia welcome extension of a ceasefire deal between Sudan's warring military factions for another five days. And Venezuela's President Nicolas Maduro visits Brazil for the first time since he was banned by former far-right President Jair Bolsonaro in 2019. And now, before we end, let us listen to Mahatma Gandhi's favorite bhajan, Vaishnav Jan by Artis from Norway. Vaishnava Jana Sa We'll be back at the same time tomorrow with the next edition of World News.